okay, I hope everybody's had a chance to, to stretch their legs a bit and move around. Um, and we'll get started talking about genes and transcripts. Um, so we've just had Astrid giving us an introduction to Ozumbul and have a look at the region page. I'm now going to take you through Ozumbul genes and we're going to look at how you can view uh, genes in Ozumbul, where they come from um, and things like that. So as um, Astrid did, we're going to talk about uh, where the, we're going to start with the presentation talking about where they come from. We're going to have a demo on getting the gene data, and then you can do the exercises um, on the Train Online course. So you should have already seen in the region views that you were just looking at with Astrid um, that this is what genes look like in Ensemble. Um, and there's lots of things we can tell about these genes um, just from the, uh, the visualization. The first is the structure of the exons and the introns. So we can see uh, what are the exons. So exons are shown as, as boxes, um, and introns are shown as lines connecting them together. Coding exons are filled in, whereas non-coding exons are empty. So we can see this uh, filled in block we've got here is the coding. This empty block um, we've got at the end is our untranslated region. Now I can actually tell that this gene is forward-stranded, and there are three things that are showing that to me. The, the first thing is this little arrow, which is pointing in the direction of the transcript. The second is the position of the gene in reference to the contig. So here's our contig, and our gene is shown above it. And the last thing is actually the shape of these introns. Where the introns um, are on forward-stranded genes, they appear as, as mountains. Whereas if we were looking at reverse-stranded genes, we would see them looking more like valleys. Um, so these are all different transcripts of, of bracket two. They're all named, named bracket two and a number. And they have different colours, and the colours mean things as well. So the gold ones are what we call merged transcripts. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail in a moment. But these are essentially transcripts where we have two different methods of annotation have, have produced them and have said this is where we think the transcript is. The red ones are protein coding, but they've only been discovered by one of our methods of annotation. And even though this is a protein coding gene, it does have three non-coding transcripts, which we can see in blue. So the golden transcripts are identical annotations between our two different methods, which we call Ensemble Automatic and Havana Manual Annotation. And we have these for human, mouse, zebrafish, and rat. And we consider these to be high confidence and quality. Um, so we have our two methods of annotation. The automatic annotation we do for every single species in our database, whereas the manual annotation is just done for this uh, small select group. And there is a very good reason for this. The automatic annotation is done genome-wide. We have a pipeline that takes known proteins in cDNA. So these are real biological sequences that people have, have identified. Um, and we use sequence matching to plot them onto the genome. And it's quite a complicated, involved process. It's not just a case of running a blast. Um, and this allows us to identify everywhere where there are genes on the genome. One of the things that people always think when they hear the phrase automatic gene annotation is that we're just finding open reading frames in the genome. And this is what's called ab initio prediction. We do not do this as part of our gene annotation. We would never predict a gene just on the basis of an open reading frame. We have to have real biological data for it. So um, the biological evidence we use, we use data which we get from the international um, the ICC, uh, which is made up of the ENA, um, GenBank, and DVDJ. And people can deposit their cDNAs and express sequence tags in there. And then more recently, we've been using RNA-seq data um, from there as well. So there we've got uh, sequences of of, um, of 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 um, nucleotides. We also use sequences from proteins, so we use Uniprot and Uniprot. We use both divisions of Uniprot, the Swissprot manually curated proteins and the Tremble unreviewed translations. The other thing we use, if we're working with species that have less data um, in these public databases, we will use homology to other species. So, for example, the chimp genome was um, annotated by mapping cDNAs and proteins from the human onto the chimp genome. 
managing the patient is very, very different. It is a lot slower, and this is because it is so very involved. So in this case, we have real people rather than computers, and they will sit and they will look at genes, um, and they're using data from databases. They're using data from papers, and they're examining each gene one by one. And a gene can be about half a day's work um, or more, depending on, on what's involved. And for this reason, we only do it for a much smaller number of species. So manual and automatic annotation does come out with slightly different answers. Um, manual annotation tends to be a lot more comprehensive. You get more trans transcripts per gene, especially non-coding transcripts. And you get more genes overall, especially again non-coding. And this is because when you manually annotate, you can be a lot more flexible with what your, your lab lecture is. Um, the evidence is evaluated on an individual level. You look at each piece of evidence and you say, yes, I think this is enough to say that this, gene, this transcript is real. Whereas with automatic annotation, you just have to set thresholds. You just have to say, this is, this is the minimum of what we, we need. Um, but it can be that, so you end up with a lot more stuff that perhaps has a bit less evidence behind it in the manually annotated data. But manual annotation can also annotate really fiddly, difficult, um, to annotate features such as unsensitive regions, spike sites, single exon transcript is surprisingly difficult to annotate. And then things like immunoglobulins, which undergo a somatic recombination, um, and so they're not kind of classic genes, but they're very, very different, making them very difficult to, to annotate. Um, just to confuse everyone with terminology, um, there is a project called GenCode, um, and GenCode is made up of the ensemble genes. Um, so the ensemble automatically annotated gene and the Havana manually annotated gene um, and the merged gene set. And this is this is only human and mouse. So these genes then undergo an extra level of, of quality control for human and mouse. But because of the high quality nature of this gene set, it's the de default gene set used by major sequencing projects such as ENCODE, Thousand Genomes, uh, Nomad, CPEX, um, other such. Um, projects out there. We also have something called CCDS, which stands for Consensus Coding DNA Sequence. Again, it's only for human now, and it's an agreement between ourselves um, and RefSeq. So wherever our, our coding regions, so ignoring the untranslated regions, um, match up with a RefSeq coding region, these this transcript will get assigned to CCDS. And then it's um, UCSC do the quality control on this um, as well. So you can look at these um, in the browser as well. So you find if you're looking at, at high, high quality transcripts, you want to find the old ones and you also want to find the ones with the CCDF because these are the ones where more different groups, more different methods of annotation agree with them. For a small number of species, we also have imported annotation. Um, so Chinese hamster ovary, which is a very important cell type. Um, plus two um, graded mouse, uh, Ricky and um, Drew Mouse, we imported from um, other sources. These are, are trusted sources who we know um, are going to annotate to, to high quality, but we also carry out rigorous quality control on these so that we know that these are to the same standard as the other um, genomes we have. One of the things you find um, when you start looking at the transcripts in Ensemble and the genes is that actually a lot of them have very large numbers of, of transcripts. And this, for very practical reasons, can be quite difficult to, to work with. Um, and so a lot of people prefer to just pick a transcript, pick the, the, the most valid transcript. And it's actually a very hard thing to define. Um, so we have a number of clues that we give you that help you to, to identify this. So one of the things we have is GenCode Basic. So when we annotate genes, um, we will use fragments. So if there is a protein fragment in Uniplot, but we can plot that protein fragment onto the genome, but there's no ATG, there's no stop code on, we would still annotate that and, and point out where it is. Because that's something that somebody might, might find and might want to know more about. Um, but we will label it as 5' incomplete if it lacks an ATG. Uh, three prime incomplete if it lacks a stop code on. If you want to ignore those, if you only want complete things, then you can use gen code basic. 
We also have transcript support level, which is a score between one and five for quality. That one is the best. Um, we have the appointment supplies form. The pre a group in, I think, um, I forget. Um, but they combine together data like protein structural information, uh, functionally important reviews, and evidence from cross species alignment. And they they give things labels like the, the principal one, alternative one, things like that. We'll see those as we look into the browser. If you combine these with CCDF and golden transcripts, you can usually get down to one or two transcripts per gene. But sometimes you still might have more than one. And maybe in that case, maybe you do need to work with more than one. We also assign day by day. If you ever work with any data database, they will have their own system of stable IDs. The major benefit of stable IDs is that the names change, different gene names are adopted by different communities. If you work with stable IDs, you know that no matter what change happens in the community, you're still um, accessing the same genomic locus. Ensemble stable IDs are in the form ENS, for ensemble, and then GPD, T for transcript, T for peptide, E for exon. There's quite a few of these. Um, there's a there's a, a link you can go to to get the full list. And then a, an 11 digit number. And if you're working with something that isn't human, if you're working with mouse or zebrafish or cow or whatever, um, there's a three letter um, suffix which is added between the ENS and the letter telling you what it is. So you can go to ENS MUS for mouse, ENS DAR for, for zebrafish. Um, and the, these are very, very useful to keep track. Um, it's always worth writing down the stable ID of any um, identifier that you use um, in your studies. We also use gene ontology to describe um, what genes do. And gene ontology is absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, if you're writing a paper or a, a, a sort of ex very prose-based um, website describing the function of a gene, you can write some lovely sentences describing what the gene does. And that's great for another person who goes along and happens to read that. It is not very good for a computer to read because computers, because the way we write and the way computers read are very different. The first problem is synonyms. Um, there are multiple terms for the same thing. So the example I've given here is innate immunity or non-specific immunity. Completely entertaining interchangeable terms that people use in different circumstances. So if I wrote my paper describing about how my gene um, was involved in the native community and you went to try and do a search for the genes involved in the native community, you wouldn't find my paper. Another problem is, is the specificity. Um, I might have written my paper describing all about how um, my gene is involved in natural killer cells. And do not at any point mention the phrase, either phrase, innate immunity or non-specific immunity, because natural killer cells is just part of, of those two processes. So again, a search for those things wouldn't find my paragraph that I have written. Gene ontology is So what happens is somebody comes along from gene ontology and they read the paper and they assign a go term to the gene. And somebody uh, reads the database. Um, reads through the papers and assigns the term to the gene. So the term that they would use if they've read my paper talking about this would be GO45087 um, innate immune response. And that's the, the fixed terminology that's used. The other benefit is that they form a hierarchy. So innate immune response is itself a daughter term of the term immune response. It then has a number of daughter terms itself. Um, such as the one we talked about before, natural killer cell mediated immunity. The benefit of this hierarchy then is if I search the database for innate immune response, I won't just find all the genes that have got innate immune response attached to them, but I will actually find all the genes which have all of these terms attached to them as well. So it makes it very, very searchable. And ensemble show the go terms attached to the genes, so you can go back the other way as well. You can go from the gene to go terms, and find out what the gene does, but you can go from a go term to genes and find out all the, the genes that do that thing. Um, so we have a lot more information about the gene annotation system um, in our paper. I have the, the slides 
um, in the two Slack channels um, so you can get to this link. Um, and I will also make sure it's available in the plain online course. So we're going to have a look at a gene um, called ESPN. We're going to find out more information about it and its transcript. So I'm going to hop out of my presentation here. And annoyingly, the bar where I need to click up, there we go. So I have just gone to a, I'm just at a random region page here just to point out um, I'll be at a completely different page to you if you're in um, Astrid's demo. Just to point out that if you just click on any of the genes in the um, in this view, you will get a link to go to the gene tab with the the gene ID. So you can get to to genes this way if you found something um, there. But the other way you can find um, genes is to go to this is to use the search. You, if you search here in the top left or on the home page. I'll just go back to the home page. And if I put in my gene name ESPS and hit go, this doesn't work like the search that Astrid just did. This is doing a search for the text. So it finds the human gene ESPN first of all. I can filter down to um, genes to transcript species, or I can filter down to, to different species um, as well. But it's found my human gene first. So I'm going to hit my human gene. And this takes me to the gene tab. So Astrid mentioned the, the tabbing system earlier. So we've now got a location tab and a gene tab. And here in the gene tab, we have a menu with all of the different things that I might want to look at and find out about my gene. Um, so we can see it, its name, its ensemble ID. We can see its uh, genomic location. And if I scroll down, I can see a graphical display of the, the, the gene and its transcript. I've also got this button here to show transcript table. If I open this up, so we've got our transcript table listing all our different transcripts. And you'll see we've got the colors that I mentioned earlier. We can see what biotype they are. Um, and we can do things like CCDS um, and these flags I mentioned before. I'm going to hide the transcript table for now. We'll look at that later. I'm going to explore some of these links over on the left. So the first one I'm going to go to is sequence. Um, and here, here we can see the sequence of the gene. We can see um, 600 bases upstream. And then we have the first exon of, um, of the gene. The exons are highlighted in this kind of peachy color. Um, and so this is an exon of a neighboring gene because it doesn't have the red text. This red text is the, the exon of our, our gene of interest. And just like with the, the region view, I can configure the page. So if I go into configure this page, you'll see I can do things like um, show variants. I'm going to show variants. I'm going to go with yes and show links. And I'm just going to pick miss sense variant only. And I'm also going to add line numbering, which I'm going to do relative to this sequence. And just as I could, as Astrid showed you with the region, I can just save and close, and it will load with um, with the data that I've added. So it's now loaded up these missense variants. I can export the data. I can download the sequence. I can download just plain FASTA, um, or I can download rich text format. So if I wanted to put this into some kind of sequence analysis tool, I would go with FASTA. But if I went with rich text format, it gives me there's a little graphic down here. It basically shows it the way that we're looking at it right now with all the colored highlights and things. And so that's quite good if you want to open it in something like Word and um, examine the, the, the sequence quite visually. I'm not going to download that now. I'll just leave that. And we're going to look at some other um, things on the, the menu here. I'm going to go to... Um, Go biological process. So this is looking at the gene ontology. So here we can see some of the functions of the gene. So we've got sensory perception of sound, locomotory behavior. We can see the evidence for this. So this was inferred by electronic annotation. This was inferred from a mutant phenotype. And we can see where this annotation came from. And we've also got molecular function and cellular components. So go into three categories. Biological processes what it does. Uh, molecular function, if I click on that, 
you can see that kind of how it does it. So it does it by binding actin. And cellular component is where it does it in the cell, so in the cytoplasm, in the, the um, microvillus, things like that. If I want to know where it does this in the body, I can go to gene expression, um, which is here in the menu. And this shows me everywhere that, that we see expression of this um, of this gene. And this is actually a widget that we've brought in um, that comes from um, Expression Atlas. And I believe your, um, the group from Uni Andes will be having a, a lecture from um, Expression Atlas. So you can see we've got a little body here. We can see the expression levels in different tissues from um, different experiments. And if I hover over them, I've got to pick a good tissue here. Yeah, if I hover the kidney, you can see that the kidney highlights in our little widget, our little man over there. If you're working with sex-specific tissues, you may want to switch it from a man to a woman um, for that reason. I'm going to show you now external references. Um, so Gene Expression Atlas is one of the databases we link out to. We do link out to a lot of different databases because we know that while we have a lot of data and it's very useful, there are many other databases that have useful data on these genes that may be expressed in a different way or may be very different. So you can go to things like, you can get a link um, directly to places like Expression Atlas. Um, OMIM is a really nice place to go for very long descriptions of what genes are and what phenotypes are. And you can also go to NCBI, Wikigene, things like that. I'm going to go to um, Transcript Comparison now, which is near the top, because we're going to have a look at all these different transcripts. Um, so if I now show the transcript again, you can see we've got quite a lot of different transcripts. I'd like to know what the differences between them are. And the way I can do this, if I go to this Select Transcripts button, which is kind of breathing at me here at the bottom, I can choose which transcripts I want to see. So if I just select the top three here, I can also select all of the proteins including all of the contained intron, things like that. But I'm just selecting the top three, and I'm going to save the size. Now, I think this is really useful for doing things like designing RT-PCR primers, because you can see which, which exons or which um, intron junctions are common to, to all the different transcripts and which ones are unique. So if you wanted to, to do RT-PCR of just one of the transcripts, you want to do RT-PCR of all of the transcripts, you could identify the bits of sequence that would be relevant to amplify for that. So what we've got is we've got the sequence of ESPN along the top, and then we have three rows, one for each of our, our three transcripts that we've selected. And we can see that the first one is transcribed from right near the very beginning. So we're in orange, we're in its untranslated region. And then we go into blue, which is the translated sequence. And then down here it goes gray, which is our intron. But the other two transcripts are not transcribed from this early point in the gene at all. If I scroll down to about two thirds of the way down, you see I reach a point where we've got more than one of them being transcribed. So you can see how this would be useful for finding primers. So talking about the transcripts, let's explore one individually. I'm going to open up the transcript table again. And we talked about um, how you would choose a transcript for further study. Now for this particular gene, the one I would pick is ESPN201, this one at the top. There are various reasons for this. The first is that it's, it's um, a golden transcript. So it's got identical annotation between the automatic and the manual annotation. It also has a matching coding region with RefSeq, because it's got a CCDS. We've got a link here out to RefSeq. It's also transcript support level one. And if I hover over that, you can see that this is the most, the most supported transcript level. Um, it's not truncated, it's a Genco basic. And it's in the pre it's only a principle two, um, but we don't actually have a principle one. We've got two principle twos. Um, so these are the two that could be the one. But I think I'm going to go with this one because it's got the TSL one, um, because it's got this CCDS. We click on the link. And this takes me to the transcript tab. So you can see I've got another tab open here at the top. I'm going to hide my table again because it's quite big. You can see I've got a graphic showing the transcript. And I can look at the sequence of the transcript as well. So one way, which again I think is nice for PCR primers, 
is um, the exons link, which is right near the top. And you can see I've got a table which shows me the exon identifiers, a bit of information such as the phase and the length, and then the sequence of each exon um, with the introns showed separately. I can expand these introns if I want to. Again, configure this page. Always look for configure this page. I can expand the introns. I type the introns. Um, I could add variants onto this page. I can edit it and make it show me the data that I, I really need. The one that I actually think is best for looking at variants is the cDNA page, though. And the reason I like the cDNA page for variants is because it shows us the protein sequence as well as the cDNA. So you can see we've now got three lines of sequence. The top line is our cDNA. The second line is better if I show you this one. The second line is the coding sequence. And the third line is the amino acid sequence. So you can see that um, we've got the codons highlighted. So you can see we've got this kind of white, yellow, white, yellow. I added the missent variants of the earlier view, so they're showing in this view as well. And wherever we've got a missent variant, you can see that the amino acid is highlighted in red. So I think this is really nice for kind of thinking about variants in terms of both the genomic sequence and, and the amino acid sequence. Um, so I think this is useful for that purpose. Um, so just like with the um, with the gene, you can see the vari the transcript in other databases. So if I go to general identifiers here on the left, what I get is a link out to other databases which have data on this transcript. So we have things like CTDS, the ENA, Human Protein Atlas. So now because we've got a transcript, it's got its own protein, it's protein coding transcript. So it links out to protein data as well. There's things like Uniprop. Um, if there is a structure available, we also have a link out to the PDB. Um, we don't for this particular um, gene, but I can just link straight out to, to other um, other data very easily. I'm just going to go to supporting evidence here because I did mention about the amount of data that supports um, whether or not a transcript really exists. So if I go into supporting evidence, what I get is a little graphic that shows me all of the bits of data that we used by our annotators to put this together. So we have the bits of data that support the whole thing. So we have the structure of it here. And so this one, this NM, if I click on it, you can see the seq DNA. Um, I've also got, this is a uniprot. Um, so you can see the stuff that supports the whole thing. We've got exon supporting evidence that was used by the automatic annotation. And exon supporting evidence that was used by the Havana annotation as well. So you can see that the stuff, the second, the lower level is the stuff that was used by Havana. And we've got a lot more bitty stuff because they can do the an, analyzing the individual bits of evidence. They can say, well, this bit of evidence coupled with this bit of evidence is enough to say. So you do get a lot of these kind of tiny bits of EFT, whereas the stuff supporting them um, automatically annotated um, transcripts will tend to be more formatted. So talking about proteins, I just want to show you how you can find uh, protein domains. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to have Interpro talking to at some point. But Interpro um, basically have a number of different algorithms for plotting, for predicting protein domains based on sequence. And so here we just show the output of, of Interpro um, scan on this sequence. So we can see at the we have the, the exons shown in these two shades of purple. Over here, we have an unchiron repeat domain. Over here, we have a WH2 domain. Different methods of um, predicting protein domains are better at different kinds of protein domains. So it's really best if you are interested in this kind of thing in detail to go to Interpro um, to find out a bit more about your particular domains of interest. Um, but this this view just gives you a, a nice vague idea of what domains are where in the protein. If you're not really into graphics and you prefer tables, you can get the same data if you go to domains and features, which is directly underneath it in the table um, in the menu on the left. So that's everything I wanted to show you um, about genes and transcripts. Um,
in the um, in the page. I've seen that, that Slack has been um, chattering away, so hopefully you've been um, talking to Astrid and Erin and asking all your questions there. Um, as Astrid mentioned, the course exercises are, are on the, the EBI Train Online course, so you can get on with working with them as soon as you're ready. We will try and get these videos processed and uh, posted up on there um, as early as we can tomorrow morning. If you want to, if you're working on the exercises, there are exercise solutions. Um, Slack workspace is a great place to ask questions. We will obviously not be on there all the time because we will sleep and go home and have live and things. Um, but we will try and pick up all your questions um, when we get into work. You can also email us on helpdesk on somewhere.org if you prefer not to use Slack. Um, the next course on Thursday will be Erin um, and Astrid. Um, so Erin will talk about variation data in Ensemble and the Ensemble VET. Um, and Astrid will talk about comparing genes and genomes with Ensemble Compara. Um, so the, the variation data, we have variation in phenotype data from lots of sources. We can learn how to find variants and access additional information. And then we will um, introduce the variant effect predictor. Um, as Astrid mentioned, loads and loads of help and documentation. Do check it out because it is so, so useful. Um, if you have a look at us on social media, we can tell you about all the other courses and things that we're doing. Um, and um, please sign up if you, if you use our data. Um, again, this is our team and these are our, our funders. 